All right, can everybody hear me? The mic? Maybe up. Oh, I'm terrible at these things too. Okay. Better? Worse? Okay. They should always make me go last. <laughs> I'm just gonna lift it up. It's clearly gonna work. Okay, wait, hold on. Is that good? Thank you, Lisa, for the lovely invite to, to present and to write with the word. I thought it was a, a kind of a great kind of experiment. Thank you, Sabelle, for sharing. It was so lovely. And Kristen for having this lovely space. And everyone for coming. Thank you. I'll talk a little bit about the process after the story, I think, for my still nameless short, short story. So I'll just start that now, and then afterwards, maybe I'll talk a little bit about the word, okay? So I'm gonna just turn it up. A little bit? Am I soft spoken? <laughs> I'm a little loud. <laughs> try it try it again. We good now? Yeah. That sounds louder. Okay. Alright. So my unnamed short short. Carlos stayed in bed, buried under his covers, his stomach still aching. The baby had crawled into his room during the night, and like the year before, like every year since he could remember, he picked the baby up and hid it. The baby hadn't made a sound. Without eyes, the empty sockets were dark and lonely like abandoned wells. The baby had no tongue, no skin or muscle or organs, and was made of brilliant white bone that almost glowed in the dark. The baby was his brother. I'll only be gone for a little while, mijo, Amal called, Amal called from the kitchen. Your father can't come, the sinvergüenza. Think you can be a big boy for me today? His brother, Jose Luis, curled next to him and wrapped his tiny bone hand around Carlos's pinky. Had he lived, Jose Luis would be the mirror image of Carlos, minus the scar across his forehead made the day his apa left a leatherman unattended on the nightstand. Carlos had slowly pulled the folding knife open stopping halfway to pause and make sure he was alone. Hearing his father's arguing in the bathroom, Carlos snapped it the rest of the way open with a flick of his wrist, just like when Abba watched television alone in the living room, opening and closing his knife as if in a trance. Blood appeared briefly as a thin red line across his forehead before flooding down his face as he ran the sharp edge across his skin. Pulling the blanket tighter over him and his brother, he remembered how it'd been the day he remembered how it'd been when they shared Amma's belly, them together in a dark, warm quiet, the sound of Amma's faraway voice soothing them to sleep. Carlos hadn't known he'd been absorbing most of the nutrients, at least not at first. As he grew bigger and stronger, he noticed her brother he noticed his brother remaining small and partially translucent. When Carlos couldn't stop eating, him needing every bit of the sustenance. That seems like a fell, right? <laughs> As he grew bigger and stronger, he noticed his brother remaining small and partially translucent. But Carlos couldn't stop eating, him needing every bit of the sustenance he'd been stealing to stay alive. Carlos. You have to cool it with the Halloween candy. You can't keep eating yourself sick. Amma stood in the doorway, dressed in her Denny's uniform, black grease stained slacks and polo, her apron filled with straws and loose change flung over her shoulder. She walked over to Carlos and plopped down on the bed. The way she looked at him, with a tired and unhappy smile, churned his stomach worse than the overload of sugar and chocolate. Is there something wrong with me, Amma? Carlos asked. She sighed and squeezed him tight, her body inches from the baby. Carlos wondered if Amma could feel the baby snuggled underneath the blankets just beside her leg. He hoped that she couldn't, that she would forget about the baby who lived for two hours and think only of him. How could there be anything wrong with you? You're my baby. Did you finish it? Carlos asked, already knowing the answer. Amma's altars were the most beautiful things he'd ever seen. 
The usual clutter of her dresser cleared out and replaced with bouquets of roses, white and purple and red petals sprinkled over silky cloth. Velas with fiery sacred hearts and crosses glowed. There were pictures of Nana and Tata, of Tia Stella, and other people Carlos didn't know, all in wooden frames. There was the food, plates of fresh-cut pineapple and strawberries and chunks of pomegranate, homemade pan tornillo with raisins delicately portioned under each photo. The centerpiece was a statue of La Virgen de Guadalupe, her downward-gazing face lonely and fixed on the only picture of José Luis. His body was wrinkled and bluish and covered in hair, tiny in Amma's arms. <laughs> in a forgotten corner of the photograph, Carlos's disembodied leg had made it into the frame, alone in the clear bassinet. I finished the altar last night, Amma said, and I'm taking the rest of your candy to work. If you do this to me again, you're going to be in big trouble. You always say that, Carlos said. Amma rubbed his head, her fingers sliding through his hair before stopping, for the quickest of moments on the raised scar just below his hairline. I need you to be good. I will, Carlos said. I promise. And you always say that. Amma said as she got up to leave. Please don't go to my room. Just watch some TV until I get home. Do you wish he was here? Carlos asked. That you could see him? I do, Amma said. And one day I will. I know he's waiting for us. What if he looked like a monster? Why do you always say things like that? You have to stop, Carlos. You make me worry. But would you still want to see him? Listen, I didn't give birth to any monsters. Patting him one more time on the head, Amal left the room without looking back. If she had, she would have seen the open blanket and the calavera her shrine had given birth to. Carlos watched the baby, now awake and struggling to flip himself on his back. She's talking about dying, Carlos said to the baby as he carefully turned him over and wrapped him in a towel. She's the one waiting. Carlos carried his brother to Amma's room and placed him at the center of the bed, both gently and lovingly. Rubbing his finger over the wooden frame, he could see her face, how much Amma loved his brother. He took a small bite of fruit, a taste of the strawberries and pineapple. Then he tried the bed, the bread, pulling apart pieces of the moist pan tornillo into his mouth. The first snap startled him, like always, as a crack spider webbed across the baby's forehead. Suddenly starving, Carlos stuffed the rest of the fruit into his mouth with both hands, pineapple and pomegranate juice running down his arms, strawberry seeds pushing between his gums. The top of the skull popped and then collapsed, and Carlos hurried to finish the rest of the bread. The bones of his brother's hands and feet had separated and fallen uselessly beside him, then his arms and legs disembodied. Turning to take one last look at his brother, Carlos couldn't stop himself from eating a handful of rose petals. He watched as the now pile of bones crumbled into dust, the bitter taste of flowers consuming his mouth. Thank you. So when I got the word, it, had, it came, what, November 2nd or 1st? This was right around the Dia de los Muertos, you know, I don't want to say holiday, but ritual. And on, on Facebook and, you know, on TV, it seems like Dia de los Muertos had become kind of like this commercialized, over, you know, saturated kind of event where, you know, the people dressing up and painting their faces and going trick-or-treating. And so it just seemed kind of like it was reduced to this Halloween-ish Kind of ceremony that it's a really traditional Mexican you know ritual so I wanted to write a story and go kind of deeper into the story about you know what it really kind of means which is it's a celebration of life but it's also like a deep mourning with the offerings of food and, and bread and time so that was kind of what started the story and then 
it kind of manifested itself and changed and became this kind of odd story that I don't usually write. So I wanted to thank Lisa for the opportunity and for pushing me to go someplace I normally don't go with fiction. Thank you.